why you lost things. I just want to read the names for the, the special committee. It's just a reading today. Um, they were voted um, last week. I think that was what you guys wrote down on a piece of paper. Um, it's Ralph Carpenter, uh, Daryl Williams, Kat Panike, Robbie Sanders, Peter Nizamande, Marie Panike, and Desiree Miller. Alright, so that's just a reading. And, um, I think that special committee comprises of the seven names and the, the existing board. Today's scripture reading, if you would like to please turn your Bibles with me, to Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. A very well-known portion of scripture. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and open the door, I'll come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. May God add a special blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Morning church, can I please all bow your heads? Dear Lord, I'd just like to thank you Lord for this very special day. I thank you Lord for giving us the privilege to come into your house of worship today. Please Lord, I pray Lord that you help us as youth to deliver the message that you want us to deliver. Help us as youth to enter into each and every person's heart today. And please, Lord, I pray, Lord, that with this message that we have today, that each and every person may walk out of here a refreshed and new person. I pray, Lord, that you help us through this, and thank you, Lord, for giving us this privilege in spreading your message. I pray in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Today, our scripture reading will be taken from two passages of the Bible. The first from Nehemiah 13, verse 14. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its services. And then from Micah 3, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Shall we please stand and sing our opening hymn, hymn 311, I Would Be Like Jesus.
The deacons and deaconesses will now take up the tithes and offerings. Shall we please bow our heads for the prayer? Dear Lord, please bless the tithes and offerings so that it gets to the places where it is needed and bless those who gave and also those who are unable to give. In Jesus' name, amen. It is now time for the children to take up the lamb's offering and the story will be done by Reese.
Okay. Good morning, boys and girls. How's everybody doing today? Okay, so today's story, before we get into today's story, I have a question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Hmm? What would you like to be? A fireman. <laughs> High five. There we go. An emergency doctor, we have one of those here. What do you want to be, young lady? A doctor. A doctor. Okay, we have two doctors. Okay, so here on stage we have, we have a cricket player over there, we have a pastor, we have a teacher, we have a lawyer, and we have a race car driver. <laughs> okay, so, who, so what do your parents do? What does your mummies and daddies do? Hmm? Do you know? You don't know. Oh my. What does your mommy do? My mommy does massaging. Massaging. Oh, that's a lovely. That is something lovely. Okay, so today's story is about a little boy named Samuel. Now Samuel worked. Samuel worked in the in the um he was he was working in the in the temple. So he was he was one of the he was like a priest in the temple, but because he was only five years old when he got to the temple, he was, as we would call, an appy. So he was learning to do the job. So as, a, um, as an apprentice, or what we would call a learner in the temple, he would sweep the floors and open the curtains and light the candlesticks and make sure the bread is there and find and always keep it neat and tidy. So one day, Samuel had finished all his chores, he closed the curtains after the service of the day, and he was off to bed. And while he's laying in his bed, he hears a voice, Samuel, Samuel. And he gets up and he runs over to, to the high priest Eli's bedroom and he's, yes, master, you called me. And Eli says, no, son, I did not call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel, an obedient little boy, he goes back to bed, he gets into his bed, and again, he hears the Lord calling. Now, he doesn't know it's the Lord calling, but he hears this voice. He says, and it says, Samuel, Samuel. And he says, I'm sure Eli is calling me. So he gets up, he runs over to Eli's room, and he's like, yes, master, you called me. And Eli says, no, son, I did not call you. Now Eli realizes that it's God calling Samuel. So he says to Samuel, Samuel, the next time you hear that voice, say, yes, Lord, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel, he's an obedient boy. He goes, he gets into his bed again, and he lays, and as he's drifting off to sleep, he hears the voice again, and he says, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel simply says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And God has a good conversation with Samuel and tells Samuel all the bad things that Eli's sons are doing. And he tells Samuel to warn Eli and tell Eli that he needs to tell, he needs to tell Eli that his sons are not to, going according to God's will and that they need to change. And that is how Samuel became a prophet in the, king, in the kingdom of Israel. And that is how we need to be obedient to our mummies and daddies and always listen for God's voice so that one day we can also be called. Okay, can you do that? So who wants to pray? No one wants to pray. Okay, I'll pray. Let's close our eyes. Thank you, Lord, that we, could, that we can listen to a story about Samuel, Lord. Please teach us to be obedient and to listen for your voice so that we can know what you want us to do when we grow up. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.
August with a special item by Christina and Kelly. Cause as I walk from my 
Good morning, church. This morning, our sermon is entitled, How Do You Want to Be Remembered? Please turn with me again in your Bibles to our scripture reading, Nehemiah 13, verse 14. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its services. And then we'll go to Micah 3, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Martin Luther King fought for freedom, stood for his rights, but not once did he do anything with violence. Abraham Lincoln went against everyone just to abolish slavery. Nelson Mandela could have been bitter, but he decided to be better. Bill Gates was a dropout, but look where he is now. He uses his money for the upliftment of others. Ben Carson started off thinking he was stupid, but now he is the best pediatric neurosurgeon in the world. There are also quite a few people who are well known for the bad things they did during their lifetimes, namely Adolf Hitler, Abraham, uh, Alexander the Great, Napoleon Bonaparte, to name a few. The one thing all of these people have in common is that they are all remembered for something. Each one of these people left their mark on the world, be it good or bad. The question which will be raised today is, Will we as Seventh-day Adventists be remembered for the difference we make in the lives of others? Or will we just be remembered for being the denomination that went to church on a Saturday? We need to ask ourselves this question. What are we doing to make a difference in the world we live in? Are we showing people God's character? Are we being the light in this world of darkness? Do people look at us and say, if that's how SDA acts, I would love to be like them? Or do they say, if that's how an SDA acts, I'm glad I'm not a part of that church. People watch us very closely, and they observe what we do, how we act, how we treat others, how we react when someone does something bad to us, and how we handle bad situations. We were all put on this earth for a purpose, to make a difference in some way. Our jobs as SDAs is for us to show others the love of God, to show them that there is a God and that he cares for all of us, and to be an example of his character. Are people going to actually going to remember us, look back and say, that person really made a difference in my life. I am here because of so and so, or will we just be forgotten? Are you willing to be an example of Jesus for the people around you? Are you willing to show them what God, God's character is like? Are you willing to show them the unconditional love that God has for us? Today, we will be presenting Bible characters who left positive legacies and those who left negative legacies. Today, I'll be talking about Jonathan. For me, for me he is one of the sometimes overlooked Bible characters. When Saul was king, Jonathan often led parts of the army. You can see this in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 14. And another example is in the battle where his, in which he and his father died. He, as Saul's first son, had the birthright to take the throne. And having led sections of the army, one can assume that many of the men did want him to become king. God worked miracles on him. And one clear example, when he and his armor bearer, who at the time were lightly armed with not much more than Jonathan carrying a sword and a shield and his armor bearer, either a farming stool or perhaps the ax and a shield, and managed to kill 20 fully armed Philistine warriors. And through this, God led the entire Philistine army into confusion and they fled before the Israelites. In verse 24 onwards, we hear how Saul takes an oath which pro prohibits any of his men to eat until nightfall. Jonathan, unaware of this oath, eats honey that the army found in the forest they were marching through, which nearly led to his death, if not for the men which trusted and stood up to Jonathan, thanks to God's doing. 
Later in chapter 16, David has been anointed and in service of Saul, who will soon leave the throne after losing favor with God because of his sins. Saul had become jealous of him, and most significantly after David killed Goliath, Saul threatened his life. This is where Jonathan steps in and warns David, and even tries to persuade Saul not to kill him. Chapter 20, verse 18 to 23, and verse 42, is showing how God acted in Jonathan, made him feel no jealousy, and even to protect the Lord's chosen one, David. Jonathan led a noble, and though not much is told about his spiritual life, life, uh, God worked miracles through him. To add to the fact, he also didn't directly disobey his father, even when warning David that his father is threatening to kill him. He could have stood up or even killed Saul to allow David to, to the throne, as he saw how much his father had strayed from God. He was an obedient child, a loyal friend, friend, and they'd no dishonor to his name or strayed from God. And is a good of and is a good example of who we should live to be and then ser- and the integrity we should live by. Certainly, I'm not a youth. (laughs) Two years ago, I became a grandfather. And uh, I thank the Lord for giving me the opportunity um, to live this time and see my grandchild. I'm here today because the youth group is my care group, for those who didn't know. Um, For those fathers who are sitting in the pews, aspiring to be grandfathers, well, you just have to wait your turn. (laughs) Unfortunately, it comes when you you don't prepare for it or you don't least expect it, but I'm proud to be there. I've chosen two characters. The other character is a living person. He's lingering in prison. He had a profound status. The other person, character, died about 2,000 or more years ago. He died before our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. Selfishness, greed, pride, and covetousness marked the lives of these two characters. John Leonard O was a, a, a fire captain, an arson investigator. It is unusual for a person who works for the fire department to occupy the two positions, to be an arsonist and to be a, a, a fire investigator. Apparently, John O. had both, which is very unusual. Um, His career spanned a decade, which saw him unsold a number of insidious arson cases, but this was not marred with controversy. In one of uh, his incidents, a, in this fire, a, a 50-year-old lady and a two-year uh, grandchild perished in this incident, and uh, two other uh, victims were the workers in that, sh- in that shop. The incendiary device which he used comprised of a, a cigarette, a matchstick, and a writing paper and a a rubber ribbon, which he used to secure these. John O. used to light up this cigarette and go to a populated shop and find a spot where there was a lot of combustible materials and just deposit that particular device there. And then all of a sudden, the shop was engulfed in fire and the rest you can deduce from there. 
In his book, in his book, Fire Lover, Joseph Warmer profiles John Leonard O, known for his uncanny instincts in solving arson cases, or often astounded others, other investigators with a seemingly brilliant deductions in determining the cause of incendiary crime. As it turned out, neither instinct nor brilliance played any role, or solved many of these cases by first-hand knowledge. He bent down businesses and homes for over a decade. Investigators suspect or may have intentionally set as many as 2,000 fires costing over millions of US dollars. Right. So that was motivated by selfishness, greed, and pride. Uh, one would um, just wonder uh, why we would discuss Judas Iscariot, which brings you to my second character. We often distance ourselves from this character because of the history that surround him. But is that so? If we examine our hearts closely, I think we at times fall into the same trap that Judas did. Alan G. White writes in her book, uh, Conflict and Courage about Judas. While Judas was, uh, while Jesus was preparing the disciples for their ordination, one who had been known who had not been summoned age his presence among them, it was Judas Iscariot, a man who professed to be a follower of Christ. Judas became Jesus, believed Jesus to be the Messiah, and by joining the apostles, he hoped to secure a high position in the new kingdom. The disciples were anxious that Judas uh, should become one of their member. He was a commanding, he was commanding in appearance, a man of keen discernment and executive ability. And they commended him to Jesus as one who would greatly assist him in his work. The after history of Judas would show them the danger of allowing any worldly consideration to have weight in deciding the fitness of men for the work of God. Judas had the same opportunities as had the other disciples. He listened to the same precious lessons, but the practice of the truth which Christ required was at variance with the desires and purpose of Judas, and he would not yield his ideas in order to receive wisdom from heaven. For the love of money is the root of all evil. You can read this in 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. How tenderly the Savior dealt with him. Who was to betray him? In his teaching, Jesus dwelt upon the principles of benevolence that struck at every root of covetousness. He presented before Judas the heinous character of greed. Jesus dealt with him no sharp rebuke for his covetousness, but with divine patience, he bore with the erring man, even while giving him evidence that he read his heart as an open book. Such Satan is playing the game of life for every soul. He knows that practical sympathy is the test of purity and unselfishness of the heart, and he will 
make every possible effort to close our hearts to the needs of others. He will bring in many things to prevent the expression of love and sympathy. It is thus that he ruined Judas. Judas was constantly planning to benefit self. In this, he represents a large class of professed Christians of today. Therefore, we need to study his character, his case. We are as near to Christ as he was. Yet, if, as with Judas, association with Christ does not make us one with him, if it does not cultivate within our hearts a sincere sympathy for those for whom Christ gave his life, we are in the same danger as was Judas. You can read about the story of Judas in Matthew 27 and Luke 22. We need to guard against the first deviation from righteousness. For one transgression, one neglect to manifest the spirit of Christ opens the way for another and still another until the mind is overmastered by the principle of the enemy. If cultivated, the spirit of selfishness becomes a devouring passion which nothing but the power of Christ can subdue. His experience with Judas is recorded in the Bible to show his long patience with perverse human nature. He has said that false brethren will be found in the church till the close of time. My question to you, church, is that are we associating our lives with the traits and the characteristics of Judas, or are we associating our traits and our characteristics in line with Christ who came and, and died for us? Think about these things. Thank you. Good morning, church. Um, my name is Caitlin, as most of you know. I grew up in this church. Um, reputation. What do you think people will say when someone mentions your name? What do they think about about you? For me, when I'm in school, most people know me as either Mr. Rubin's daughter, because my dad's a maths teacher in my school, or either Jared Rubin's sister, because Jared excelled in matric. But I have a goal that when I leave the school, I want to make my own reputation before I leave. So I chose to speak about Stephen, because um, Stephen was the age of most of our youth here. And Stephen, I just thought Stephen's story is quite amazing. So I'm going to speak a little bit about his story first, and then we'll see, um, then I'll talk to you about what he was remembered for. So Stephen spoke the Greek language and was familiar with the customs of the Greeks. Because of this, he found the opportunity to preach the gospel in the synagogues of the Greek Jews and boldly spoke of his faith. Educated rabbis and doctors of the law engaged him in public discussion, but they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. He completely defeated his opponents. To him, the promise was fulfilled. I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist that is found in Luke 21, verse 25. The priests and the rulers were filled with bitter hatred. 
they determined to silence his voice. Several times they had bribed the Roman authorities to overlook situations where the Jews had tried, condemned, and executed prisoners. The enemies of Stephen did not doubt that they could do this again, so they brought him before the Sanhedrin council for trial. Well-educated Jews were called in to refute the arguments of the prisoner. Saul of Tarsus was there and used eloquence and logic to convince the people that Stephen was preaching dangerous doctrines. But in Stephen, he, he met someone who had a full understanding of God's purpose in spreading the gospel to other nations. The priests and rulers determined to make an example of Stephen. It would satisfy their revengeful hatred and they would prevent others from adopting his belief. They hired witnesses to give false testimony. We have heard him say, they declared, that Jesus, Na that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. A holy radiance shines on Stephen's face as Stephen stood to answer the charges. All who sat in the council saw his face as the face of an angel. Many tre trembled and shaded their faces, but the ruler's stubborn unbelief and prejudice did not waver. Stephen began his defense in a clear, thrilling voice that rang through the council hall. In words that held the assembly spellbound, he reviewed the history of the chosen people. He showed a thorough knowledge of the Jewish religious system and the spiritual interpretation of it now evident in Christ. He made plain his loyalty to God and the Jewish faith, while he connected Jesus Christ with all the Jewish history. When Stephen connected Christ with prophecies, the priest, pretending to be horror-stricken, tore his robe. To Stephen, this was a signal that he was giving his last testimony. He abruptly ended his sermon. And you know how the story ends. Stephen gets stoned to death. What an amazing man was Stephen. He is a largely overlooked individual. We need to know this man. This is a man who is great by every divine measure. He is full of everything that every believer should be full of. Stephen is the catalyst for the dispersion of the church. It was because of his martyrdom and the persecution that was launched, that was launched at the point of his martyrdom that the believers scattered. And that was the purpose of God in his martyrdom, because Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the world. The mantle of Stephen falls strangely on Saul, one of Stephen's most bitter enemies. In fact, it may be that the Apostle Paul owes much of his exposure to the gospel to the sermon that Stephen preached. He was essential in, to God's plan for world evangelization. It was his martyrdom, as I said, that launched the church into the world. He is also a graphic testimony that it's not the length of a man's life that establishes his importance and his influence. In fact, the length of a man's life has sometimes very little to do with its impact. His ministry was extremely short, but that short time that he had to minister is remembered and respected by many to this day. A fun fact about Stephen's name, Stephanos, means victor's crown, and I believe he actually won that in his martyrdom. We should thank God for giving us an opportunity to meet this man, the man with the face of an angel, the beauty in that it is just striking, unforgettable. God is still looking for men and women like that who can be chosen because of their character 
and courage to, re to represent him in the world, to confront the world with the truth, and to receive all that the world throws back of hatred and rejection and persecution and violence, and stand boldly with peace and faith. So Stephen teaches us not to be afraid of spreading the word. And it does not matter how old or how young you are for you to make a difference. You should be proud of calling yourself a Christian. Because as soon as you call yourself a Christian, you are representing Christ. You should stand out in this worldly world. For example, one of my friends asked me if I was going to come to their party on a Friday night, and before I could respond, another one of my friends said, she won't be going, she's a good Christian girl. Even though most teenage girls wouldn't like to have this title as being a good Christian girl, I'm quite proud of that title. Stand out, make a difference. So ask yourself this question. Wouldn't you like to be remembered as a person that turned the world upside down, just as Stephen did? A lot of you must be thinking, but I'm not like Stephen. I can't just go out there and preach. No, not everyone can preach sermons, but everyone has a talent, and you should use that talent that you've been blessed with for the glory of God. When I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would not have a single bit of talent left and could say, I used everything that you gave me. That quote is by Irma Bombeck. So may we be such people who even when rejected and even when persecuted, rise above it all. And may Christ be seen through us as we give the glory to him. Saul's conversion. Acts 9, verse 1 to 2. Saul have been successful in his work of terrorizing Christians in Jerusalem. Extend his work to the city of Damascus. While he was, in, while he was on his way to Damascus, Saul is confronted by God. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Showing his awareness of their trials. Whenever you go through trials, he is he's there, or he knows what are you going through, and he's dealing with your case. The Lord foretells Saul's career as a witness to the Christian's gospel. In his youth, Saul did not love and fear God. A wrong act by frequent repetition leaves a permanent impression upon the mind of the, of the actor and also on the mind of those who are connected with him. The, the power of habit. Bad habits are more easily formed than good. Will never undo the evil resulting. One, one neglect, often repeated, forms a habit. One wrong act prepares their way to another. Early habit decide, decide um, a future victory or defeat. We are reading from Acts 9 verse 6. It says, um, so he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will told what, to, what you must do. Saul became poor, and he worked for God, and he was faithful. What about you? Uh, we are reading from Second Chronicles 5, verse 17.
it says, um, the, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Thanks. Morning, church. Okay, my character is Hannah. Well, we know her for her sorrow. She longed for a son but couldn't have children. We know her for her faithfulness. She never gave up hope that God would hear her prayer. We also know her for her sacrifice. She dedicated her baby Samuel to the Lord and left him at the temple to serve God all the days of his life. While Hannah had a house, she did not have a home. The ideal situation for every Jew woman was to be head of home. But Hannah did not have a child or family. Although it is true, Hannah had a loving husband who blessed her with more gifts than he did his other wife, Penaniah, it did not change the fact that she was childless. Hannah exercised acts of grace and self-control in situations where jealousy had taken over Penaniah. Hannah faced fresh insults and taunts on a daily basis from a jealous Penaniah because Alkanah loved Hannah more and blessed her with a double portion. Although the Lord had shut Hannah's womb, her heart was still open towards him. Hannah's supplication. Childless, yes. Barren, no. Oh, prayerless, no. Barren, she still believed, and her pain found refuge in prayer. How moving is the episode of Hannah pouring out her soul before God in his house and vowing that if he would give her a son, she would give him back to God for his exclusive use. She made a promise and kept her promise. This part of Hannah's journey never ceases to amaze me. How often do we promise God things? If he does A, B, and C for us, and when time comes and God has done his part and heard our requests, we conveniently forget our promise. And I speak for myself when I say, I am certain that I would find it next to impossible to give up something I had been longing for and really loved, believing that it was all part of God's plan. Hannah took her sorrow to God and prayed, not that Penaniah's joy might be less, but that he would take away the cause of her own pain. In my opinion, Hannah represents the perfect picture of praying without ceasing. Hannah prayed and promised, and when her prayer was answered, she quietly redeemed her promise. God gave Hannah her son, and she gave him back to the, law, to the Lord. God being the giving God that he is, and because of Hannah's sacrifice, God continued to answer the prayers of Hannah. She had two more sons and three daughters, while Samuel grew up in the house of the Lord. Samuel grew up to reflect his reverend mother's godliness, and true to the meaning of his own name and in likeness to his mother's prevailing uh, name, prevailing, sorry, to his mother's prevailing, prevailing intercession, he became a man of prayer and intercession. Have you, ever have, you, have you ever realized besides the blessing Hannah received, which was her son, another blessing had arised in the process, in the waiting process? She became known as a woman of prayer and strength through waiting to receive her blessing, and her relationship to God grew stronger. Whenever I think of the story of Hannah, there are a few lessons I gather. First of all, I think of all Samuel became, and I realize how the excellencies of many men is due to the characters of their mothers. Hannah will always be remembered as a woman who carried her trial and yearning to God in prayer. She teaches us the importance of intercession and how to be faithful in keeping your promises to the Lord and to others. Hannah knew how to respond with grace or not to respond at all. Hannah showed restraint with her words. She not only knew the right things to say, but also when to say nothing. 
For years, Penaniah, Achanah's other wife, ridiculed Hannah for her infertility. Yet, instead of responding to her tormentor, she kept her mouth shut. Are these not all good traits us as modern day Christians should strive to possess and be remembered by? People of strong faith, prayer, and having the right words to say. Unlike Penaniah's thoughtless, unloving words that caused sorrow to Hannah, and in our case, to others in our lives. Therefore, it is necessary to guard our tongues. In Colossians, Colossians 3 verse 12, it reads, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Happy Sabbath, church. Um, Dorcas, the woman God raised from the dead. A woman of strength, courage, and obedience. As the saying goes, that actions speak louder than words. It is indeed proven true in the story of Dorcas. Her actions spoke deeply to those around her and continues to do so today. Because of her acts of kindness, she was loved and respected by others. In this generation or day and age, we just do things so that we can have a good reputation. But do we ever ask ourselves whether we have one with God? And in doing so, we perpetuate the cycle of pride within the human nature. Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, Pride before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Yet Dorcas was the complete opposite. She gave even when she had inadequate resources to do so. These days, we only give when it is all good. But when that phase is over, what happens? We forget and neglect God and only come back when it has hit rock bottom. We make excuses for our actions, yet God grants us the breath of life with no hesitation. She was mourned for deeply because of the persona she portrayed. They were so deeply touched that they felt the need to go call a disciple of Jesus to bring back to life a life that was so dear to them. Wouldn't you want to be remembered like that? A, as a person so meaningful that the people would like to bring you back. Or as a person who merely worshipped on a Saturday. Characteristics of the biblical character put to use. The story of Dorcas is often overlooked, but there are many lessons we can draw from it. One, we should be steadfast in our faith. Stand firm and mark your territory. We should be in tranquility with one another. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John 4 verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. We should be patient and understanding. We should have a passion for using our talents for the Lord. 1 Timothy 4 verse 14 says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of eldership. We should love and treat one another with the same dignity and respect you would like to receive. We should be compassionate. This just comes down to the simple basics that our character should reflect the character of God. We should follow in the footsteps of our Heavenly Father. We should not be ashamed to be the children of God. In fact, we should embrace it. Sometimes pride gets in the way of us actually getting to know God. We often think highly of ourselves because we think we know better. She did not let the bitterness of the world we live in consume her, but instead she remained firmly grounded in God. Speaking of bitterness, why do we find it so hard to smile at our neighbors? In conclusion to my character analysis, there's an old saying which goes like this. You can give without loving, 
but you can never love without giving. Wait, I think I need to repeat that. You can give without loving, but you can never love without giving. To love is to give. Be the kind of love that will be cherished in one's heart. Amen. I chose as my character, Solomon. David's charge to Solomon. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Walk in, so be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands his laws and regulations, as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you go. What sound advice to give your son on your deathbed? The promises of blessing were made on the condition of obedience. Merely by being David's chosen son was not going to be enough for Solomon. Bloodline does not guarantee anything, not then and certainly not now. We see in chapter 3 of 1 Kings how Solomon reveals a heart surrendered to God, a heart aware of its unworthiness, of its own fragility and need. In this chapter, Solomon's attitude, the one that gave him so much potential to be used by God, is revealed. Solomon was never so rich or so wise or so truly great as when he confessed, I'm but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. It's hard to understand why Solomon would be so humble and dependent. In 1 Kings 3 verse 5 we read, the Lord says to young Solomon, Ask, what shall I give you? Imagine yourself being placed in that situation. In such a dramatic manner, what would you ask for? Would it be similar to that which Solomon asked for? God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand of the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life, from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. God blessed these people because they had obeyed his laws and his commandments. And as a result of those blessings, their lifestyle made them attractive to the world at large. Israel was to be the center of world evangelism, and the temple was to be the focal point of that activity. We have an injunction in 1 Peter 2 verse 9 to us as the modern day Israel. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We read in 1 Kings 3, verse 3, And Solomon loved the Lord. Three, eight chapters later, in 1 Kings 11, verse 1, it reads, But King Solomon loved many strange women. Solomon vacillates from the love of God to the love of many strange women. What a long or maybe short distance. In 1 Kings 11, verse 4 to 8, we read, As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of, his son, as heart of, he, of David, his father, had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the, dis, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. 
On the hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the de detestable god of the Ammonites. He did this. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense, incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. Looking back over our shoulders, many centuries later, most of us find it incredible that Solomon, having been given so much by the Lord, could have fallen as he did. He says in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 10 and 11, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused to my heart no pleasure. I, my heart took delight in all my labor, and this was a reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Solomon, having squandered the best years of his life, his youth, is now seeking to warn others from following his footsteps. Though it's important for everyone at any age to accept the Lord, the earlier the better, for a number of reasons. That's clearly his message, which is found in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, where he says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. And in conclusion, he says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 to 14, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring, into every deed, will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it be good or evil. In other words, what, whatever else Solomon is saying to us, he is at least saying... Think about who you are, why you are here, how you got here, and most important, where you are going when this short life is gone. God has given us gifts, but gifts don't last. Nothing in this life does. Amen. God is good. And all the time, my life has been hard. And I am grateful for that. Because during the 17 years of my existence, God has shown me the three steps of living a good and effective life that can make me be remembered years after I have passed. I would like to share those three steps with you. I'll be using Simon Peter's life as an example. Many of you may sometimes wonder, why does the Bible speak so much about Simon Peter than the other disciples? Peter thought and acted differently to the, to the other disciples. He was unique. I'd like to read a passage from Luke 5, verse 4 to 11. Follow me, and I will make you fishermen of men. Immediately, Simon, Peter, and the other men left everything and followed Jesus. As we can see, the first step that Peter took was choice. When you begin to understand God's power, two things will happen. You'll either have faith in him or fear of him. Peter had faith in him. He was willing to let go of everything and follow Jesus. Many of us are not willing to let go of everything and follow Jesus. We're like, yes, Jesus, I would like to follow you, but I first need to do this first. We make excuses. And if we do decide to follow Jesus, we don't do it full-heartedly. We'll give him about 70% or 99%. But that percentage that still remains is still strong enough to make us fall. I have made that mistake once. I gave him about 90%. And things were going well. I mean, you look at my baptism, and my, I was growing spiritually, and my passion to spread the gospel was increasing. But then, months later, I found myself addicted to pornography, lusting over girls, speaking about languages, and focused on the wrong things that didn't really matter. Because I wasn't willing to let God take complete control of my life, Satan had creeped in. 
God gave us his 100%. Therefore, it is only right if we do the same. At the end of, at the end of, at the end of it all, we only regret the chances we didn't take. This quote brings me to my next point, and that's chance. Matthew 14, verse 29 reads, Come on, Jesus said. Peter then got out the boat and began to walk on water towards Jesus. Peter was so desperate to become like Christ, he was willing to take the chance of getting out the, water, of getting out the boat and walking on, the, on water while the other disciples were on the boat. And it made sense for the, for the other disciples to stay on the boat because the waves were pretty bad and the storm was terrible. Peter did what probably looked like the most stupidest thing to do at that moment. And the disciples might have been like, Peter, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Are you stupid? You're gonna drown. Don't try and be like Jesus. When I was in grade five, I had a back injury. Every time I did cross country, I'd feel pain on my back. The doctor told me not to run if I felt this pain. And my friends agreed with them. My one friend told me that if I continue running, this back pain will become permanent. Knowing what she said was out of love, I still ignored her. About a year later, I made a good reputation with, my, with the people I was competing against. I became the fastest runner at my school. My point is, I was willing to take the chance. Maybe some of us are in Peter's situation. Maybe God is calling us. Maybe God is telling us to do something, and we think, ah, maybe it's a bit too risky to do it. With choice comes chance. And depending on what chance you took comes change. Peter denied Jesus, but the people were able to tell that he was one of Jesus' disciples because of the way he, he behaved, the way he dressed, and the way he talked. He made a choice to follow Jesus and took a chance to let go of everything to follow Jesus and became a changed man. Now that I've made the choice to follow God, and I've taken the chance to deny myself and let God take complete control of my life. I am now also a changed man. God has given me the strength and courage to not let other people's thoughts and opinions affect me negatively. Because we as humans should not be living for, me, for humans, I mean for other people. We should be living for God instead because he is far greater. Peter died, but he is still well respected for his faith. What are you living for? My final words are, make the choice to follow God. Take the chance to let go of everything. And the change that is required will come to love. Amen. Peter, Jonathan, Dorcas, Stephen. What made them to live a good legacy? What do we people sitting in this church have in common with such outstanding individuals? Well, while preparing my conclusion for this wonderful sermon in which this youth and two adults <laughs> has presented to all of you, I could only come up with one word, one word, Christian. Even though most people would agree with me with this observation, what are the reasons behind me making this observation? What are the reasons behind me making the statement? Well, it all comes down to this one question. What is a Christian? It's simply a person who eats Kellogg's cornflakes in the morning, toasted cheese and tomato for lunch, and spaghetti and meatballs for dinner? If that was the case, then Bokoma must be a very old company. Seriously though, what is a Christian? Have you asked yourselves that question before? 
I know I have. I remember that question popping up in my head during our Sabbath school at Devon Central Church. And I remember promising my seven-year-old self that I will search and search until I find that answer to that question. But later that day, I found myself playing FIFA 05 on my uncle's computer while wondering whether if it's okay to eat knickknacks for supper. God gave me the privilege of being born within a Seventh-day Adventist family. And me and my family used to go to that church literally each and every Sabbath. And I'll confess, not because we love that church that much, no. Because firstly, my great-grandmother's persuasion skills were top-notch, arguably the best in the world. And secondly, during those days, that church used to serve the best lunch ever. <laughs> but now, with my 18-year-old self, I'm presenting this question to all of you. What is a Christian? Well, according to the Oxford Dictionary, a Christian is simply a believer in Christianity. Okay? So another question pops up in my head. What is Christianity? Well, again, according to the Oxford Dictionary, Christianity is simply a religion that is based on the teachings and beliefs of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, if we were to sum this all up and put it in simple words, a Christian is simply a person who believes in a religion that is based on the teachings and beliefs of Jesus Christ. But for some reason, that definition doesn't sit well with me. I feel it's too vague. It's too subtle. I feel that there are a lot of people out there who might say that they do believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. But if you were to closely examine their lives, one would find that they aren't actually implementing the teachings of Jesus Christ. One would find that their actions, their speech, their behavior, their character, essentially the way in which they live their life proves contradictory to what they claim to believe. So what is my definition of a Christian? What is our definition of a Christian as Seventh-day Adventist youth? Well, we believe, we strongly believe that a Christian is a person who lives in such a way that people around him or her see nothing but a representation of who Jesus Christ is. So if I were to put that in simple words, the definition of a Christian is a representation of Jesus Christ. So I want to go back to what I said earlier about, what, about us having something in common with the good characters that our youth mentioned. If we were to use our definition of what is a Christian, do we still have something in common with these characters? Are our lives a representation of Jesus Christ? If do our actions, speech, behavior, are they reflecting the character of our Lord Jesus Christ? If you were to die today, I repeat, if you were to die today, what would your eulogy say? Will it say that this person was spiritually beneficial to this earth? Or will it say that this person fast forwarded the destruction of humanity's sense of who God is? Wonderful congregation. The reason why the characters that our youth mentioned I classified one of the most spiritually inspiring characters one could ever come across in the Bible is simply because the foundation of their being was our definition of what a Christian is. Their lives were a representation of Jesus Christ. That's why they were who they were. That's why when we think about them, we immediately associate them with the true image of what a Christian is. So how can we become like them? How can we live in such a way that when we die, people who are close to us remember us as true examples of what a Christian is? The answer is simple, really. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, reading from the New Living Translation. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. 
So what is this verse basically saying to us? Well, we should be trying to win the approval of God and not of people. If we're trying to win the approval of people, this is my favorite part, we simply can't be classified as Christ's servant. You know, there's a picture which I saved on my phone. And there it is. Jesus did not live in reaction to the devil, but he lived in response to the Father. Can I please repeat that? Jesus did not live in reaction to the devil, but he lived in response to the Father. When I looked at this picture for the first time, I was like, wow, this is so profound. This is so true. Because that's what Dorcas, Peter, Jonathan, Stephen, Hannah, this is what they did. This is what they did to defeat Satan's arrows which tried conquering their lives. So, let us have a fulfilling and rejoicing daily walk without Jesus Christ. Let us not live in reaction to the devil, but let us live in response to the Father. Let us not live for money, for power, for greed, for status. Let us not live for fulfilling our selfish and meaningless earthly desires. Let us, not live to re- let us not live to be remembered as the modern time Judases, but let us live for the man who died for us at Calvary. Let us live for the man who saved us unworthy human beings from eternal destruction. Let us live for the man who loves us so much that he came to this earth to suffer for us because of us, to give us a second chance. Let us live to be remembered as true ambassadors of our Jesus Christ. Let us live for our heavenly Father. In closing, we will sing hymn number 316, Live Out Thy Life Within Me. Thank you.
how many times in our in our lives do we feel that we need to we need to live lives that that we will also be remembered one day so i invite the church to ra raise your hands if you feel that you want to give complete and surrender all your life to god and leave a legacy that will be remembered from this day forward not a legacy that you might have lived in a in a life that you are trying to leave behind but leave the legacy that god wants you to leave so that you can also be remembered just like the disciples were and enter into god's kingdom one day so let's bow heads lord lord thank you for giving us the opportunity to share what we feel is the legacy of Christians these days as youth. Lord, please bless the people in this church. Please bless all those hands that are raised, Lord. You know that we want to be more like you. We want to live lives that will always be remembered as lives that gave what we could give to the people and lives that will never ever be questioned when the time of questioning comes about who were the real Christians, Lord. Thank you for always being there for us. Thank you for providing for our needs. Thank you for always living through us, Lord. Please shine your light so brightly in us that we will be able to be like glowing lamps to the world around and that our light will never ever go out. Thank you for giving us the Sabbath day and please bless us throughout the rest of the Sabbath day and please bless everyone in the church. In Jesus' name, amen.